People are going to fall asleep. It's this dark in here. Hopefully <laughs> not. Yeah. Um, we can get started now. I'll, um, since is Richard here, is Richard gone away suddenly? <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Yeah, he'll, be, he'll be back, I, I suspect, to fill in the blanks. Um, the, um, uh, the Kickback Seminar Series welcomes you to our weekly Thursday afternoon colloquium. The uh, uh, series uh, has filled in the, the last Thursday in March, and it is for sure <coughs> Guy Van Cleve yes. who's going to do the Baja experience for you. And somewhere else there's a schedule of whatever the others are, and I have all kinds of exciting stuff, and I can hardly keep track of all of them. Today's presentation <laughs> is uh, on the second law of thermodynamics, one of the most misunderstood issues in physics. The presenter is going to be Tom Nomoff, who's one of our two physics faculty. Um, I, I should remember much more about him than I am because I was on his selection committee. Uh, he's been teaching here since the year 2000, and he has a very <coughs> cosmopolitan uh, background. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a Berkeley graduate, go Bears, uh, he's uh, <laughs> in physics, so you know that uh, he learned his physics very well, uh, and he's been a teacher for a decade. Too ago. long to, uh, yeah, say, okay. you don't need to go there. Uh, he's, yeah. he's been a teacher, uh, I think a high school teacher, international mm -hmm. student in Italy, and, in, and he was teaching in South Africa when we got him to get on a plane for his interview here at MJC. So he has been around the world. Uh, help me welcome Tom Nomal. Thanks, Bill, for the introduction. Um, I, <clears throat> well, I'm going to have to talk pretty fast to understand we have to give up the room at a certain time. So um, you're going to be really sick of my voice by the time we're done. But if, if people have questions, um, I can stick around afterwards. OK, and go downstairs. But I guess we've got to vacate this room. So um, my presentation today is, is going to deal with some of the common misconceptions about evolution in the second law of thermodynamics. And more specifically, I'd like to take a look at this question here. Does evolution defy the second law of thermodynamics? I became interested in this topic when, well, I guess it was last November, I came across an opinion piece in the local section of our paper. And it was written by a person who was responding to a decision that had been made in the state of Kansas about whether or not to teach evolution in the science classroom. And I have it here. OK, I'll share it with you. I'll read it. Regarding Kansas again turns back on evolution, we can only hope that our state and local school boards will do the same. Science means knowledge, and true science always agrees with observable evidence. The second law of thermodynamics, entropy states that everything in the universe is running down, deteriorating, and becoming less and less orderly. Modern science verifies this law, which is in direct contradiction, contradiction to evolution. So when I came across this one morning over my coffee, I was, I was very shocked at how matter-of-factly the author asserted that evolution is in contradiction to a very fundamental physical law. Um, and I, I started to wonder if there was this common perception out there. I mean, do people really think that two very fundamental and far-reaching theories in completely different branches of science, one in biology, one in physics, could have existed for well over 100 years in apparent contradiction? Um, did, did people really think that you know, the biologists and the physicists were so isolated from one another that uh, a, a contradiction of this order of magnitude could have been uh, undiscovered? So I responded to this piece. I wrote a piece of my own, which was um, well within the guidelines set forth by the editor. And I learned a good lesson about sending in stuff to the Modesto B. They, when, when the thing was printed about three weeks later, they cut out over half of the article. Um, anything that explained why there was no contradiction was, was omitted. Um, so I began to wonder whether really the, the intent was to sort of incite emotions in the opinion section or to really educate people. So when Richard asked me if I wanted to talk about this today, I took him up on his offer. So um, where, where do these misconceptions come from? Well, OK, we're going to take a look at some of the uh, 
uh, well, I should say the field of creation science has done a whole lot to promote the idea that evolution is inconsistent with the second law. And I'd like to take a look at um, some of the excerpts from some of the leaders in this field. Here's, here's a quote by Henry Morris, who is the former director for the Institute for Creation Research. Okay, and then he says that the law of increasing entropy is an impenetrable, bar impenetrable barrier which no evolutionary mechanism yet suggested has ever been able to overcome. Evolution and entropy are opposing and mutually exclusive concepts. If the entropy principle is really a universal law, then evolution must be impossible. Here's, here's an excerpt from a man by the name of Dwayne Gish, and I put this one in here because I've seen this pamphlet distributed around our campus. Um, surprisingly enough, and this is well over 20 years ago, I came across that, that pamphlet uh, it, it, when I was in high school. Um, and it really hadn't changed a whole lot. And in it, uh, okay, Mr. Gish says that the second law states that all things left to themselves always tend to go from the complex to the simple, from the organized to the disorganized. Evolution would require just the opposite, the continually building up from the simplest to the more complex forms. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start here by taking a look at, I hope, this remote works, okay, the, the laws of thermodynamics. Um, before we can really talk about how evolution applies to the second law, we need to understand a little bit about the laws of thermodynamics. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the second law. And um, there is a certain vocabulary. If we want to be able to apply any laws in thermodynamics to a, a particular process, Okay, there's a certain vocabulary we need to understand, and I'm going to quickly talk about some terms I'm going to use today. Okay, here, when we talk about a, a thermodynamic system, we're really talking about some piece of the universe you want to consider, some collection of matter or energy in the universe okay, that you wish to consider. Once you've defined your system, then really all other matter and energy in the universe becomes part of the environment. And you can sort of imagine an imaginary system boundary that separates the system from the environment. Um, three types of systems we'll take a look at. An open system, that's one where both matter and energy can be exchanged okay, between system and environment. Um, an example of that, well, human beings, I mean, we're open systems. We continually take in matter in the form of the food we eat, okay, as well as energy in the form of the food we eat. Uh, if today's a nice day, if you were sitting in the sun earlier, okay, you're certainly taking in energy in the form of sun. We also, we excrete matter back into the environment. Um, well, every time we, we go to the bathroom. Um, oh. um, if I have problems, sure. Yeah. Okay. If, if, I mean, if you. Okay. If you, um, okay. So, a closed system. That's that's a type of system where only energy can be exchanged with the environment, okay, between system and environment. Um, we can sort of approximate our entire Earth to be a closed system if you neglect things like, okay, meteor collisions or, uh, okay, lost, okay, NASA space probes and stuff like that. But roughly, I mean, the matter on our Earth is, is there. But certainly our Earth takes in energy every day from the sun. Um, so we can say that it's an open system. Energy can enter and leave, not much matter does. Um, and finally, an, okay, an isolated system, that's, that's sort of a theoretical abstraction. Okay? The idea that an isolated system, neither matter nor energy, can actually be exchanged between the system and the environment. Um, if you think of the universe as a whole, you might consider it to be an isolated system. Um, the science of thermodynamics actually began with this man, Sadie Carnot, in the early 1800s. He was a French engineer, and he studied the uh, science of energy exchanges in heat engines. Okay, heat engines simply being devices that convert thermal energy or heat into useful work. And even though the first law of thermodynamics was originally formu formulated in terms of heat engines, what scientists soon discovered was that uh, okay, the physics, the laws, were actually applicable to all processes. So they, they sort of generalized it. So 
We're going to take a look at the first law of thermodynamics, the way it was originally formulated in terms of heat engines. And, okay, well, we got a little bit of math here. Okay, basically, it says that, well, the, the internal energy, okay, of your system, let's say for the heat engine, is simply equal to, okay, the heat, the net heat that gets added minus the work that gets done. Okay, if you don't like heat engines, I mean, think of yourself, since we say that this is generally applicable to all systems. If you think of yourself as a system, as a collection of particles, okay, well, there's a certain total energy that all those particles in you have at some point in time. And, you know, we're basically saying that there's two ways to change the total energy of those particles. You can add or remove heat. Okay, that's happening right now, well, at least in my body, in this very hot classroom. Okay, I think that uh, somehow <laughs> heat is actually entering my body. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and in the form of work, I mean, if you were to go to the gym after this and, and do some work, run on a treadmill, okay, do some work on the environment, then that's going to change the total energy of all those particles in your body, in your system. Okay, so really two ways to transfer energy uh, into or out of a system are with heat and work. Okay, um, today most students of science know the first law of thermodynamic that first law of thermodynamics is none other than the law of conservation of energy. It's been generalized to all processes, and we can say that you know we can't create or destroy energy. Energy can certainly change forms during a process, but the total amount stays constant. Okay, so I think a lot of science students say they're aware of this, but they not, may not know that this really is a statement, a generalized statement of the first law of thermodynamics. Um, well, somewhere you know, in the okay, mid-1800s, after the first law came into being, scientists realized that there was a whole bunch of processes that would not violate the first law, I mean, they're processes where energy would be conserved, yet they never really were observed to take place. Okay, and um, I mean, a couple of examples. If you were to go up to Lake Don Pedro in the foothills here in the summertime, you'd be very surprised to see that the lake would freeze over on a hot summer day. Okay, but if that were to happen, it certainly wouldn't violate the first law of thermodynamics. If all the kinetic energy of those particles in the water molecules were to spontaneously leave and go into the environment, energy would still be conserved, yet it's a process we never actually see take place. So um, <clears throat> another example, okay, this coffee cup I'm drinking from, you know, if this were to fall to the ground and break into a cabillion pieces, I'm not going to stand here waiting for those pieces to spontaneously reassemble, rise up in the air, and come back into my hand. Okay, but if that were to happen, it wouldn't violate the first law of thermodynamics. Energy would still be conserved, yet it's something we never actually see. So scientists came up with a second law of thermodynamics. They needed it to sort of tell us something about which processes really did occur in life. Okay, and originally the second law was formulated uh, in terms of heat engines. Okay, um, same before, heat engine, what does it do? It really it converts thermal energy into useful work. And okay, it's very simple to state the second law in terms of heat engines. Okay, we can simply say that there's no such thing as a 100% efficient heat engine. What that really means is that it is impossible for any device to take a given amount of heat and convert it completely into work. That there's always going to be some sort of waste heat expelled to the environment. Um, I, I like the idea of heat engines because if you actually think about our, our, our world here, well, there's a high temperature reservoir. We have thermal energy provided to us from the sun, and we can think of the cold reservoir as the earth itself. And in the process of absorbing some of this thermal energy, okay, we can get some useful work out. A 100% efficient heat engine, that would be uh, okay, the bottom picture over there. Okay, this this can't happen according to the second law, okay, that you, as heat flows from that high temperature reservoir to the low temperature reservoir, some of it must be expelled as waste heat. You can't convert all of it into useful work. Okay, um, the statement of the second law that has been so often misinterpreted is the statement in terms of entropy, okay, and 
I'm going to state this. We're going to talk a little in, in a little bit about what entropy is and what entropy isn't. Okay, but the second law of thermodynamics says that for real processes, which are irreversible, the entropy of the universe increases with time. Okay, and there's a balance equation for the second law. And you express it mathematically by saying that for a real process, the entropy of the universe increases, or the final entropy during a process must be greater than the initial entropy. Okay, and we'll return to the idea of entropy. One more interpretation I want to take a look at, and there are lots of them, because I want to get into this later in the talk, and this gets into the whole idea of self-organization in systems. This is one that really uh, hasn't made its way to the textbooks so, so much yet. This is the non-equilibrium thermodynamics interpretation of the second law, and um, sometimes called open system thermodynamics or gradient-based thermodynamics, and I sort of like the statement of it. Okay, the idea that nature abhors a gradient. Okay, the implication here being that nature will do whatever it can to get rid of a gradient. What is a gradient? A gradient is simply a difference in some physical quantity that exists in space. For example, if you talk about a temperature gradient, you're talking about a difference in temperature between two points in space. Okay, a composition gradient would be a difference in, let's say, chemical composition between two points in space or pressure, a difference in pressure between two points in space. And the second law is basically saying that nature will respond in such a way as to try to eliminate gradients. That's what happens naturally. OK, what, what is entropy? If we're going to take a look at these misconceptions, we need to get a better feel for entropy. Here, here's the problem. I mean, a lot of concepts that you learn about in science you have some sort of understanding from your everyday life experiences. If, if I was to talk about force, for example, you have a pretty good intuitive understanding of what a force is, um, whether or not you've ever taken a physics class. Okay, speed, another example, or acceleration, or momentum. Okay, entropy is perhaps the most abstract of all concepts in science, and it's, it's difficult to have or get a good intuitive understanding for what it means. And because of this, it's probably one of the most misunderstood concepts in all of science. Okay, and some of the misconceptions come about because of a, a misinterpretation of this idea. So I, I'm just going to say this. A lot of times you hear entropy used synonymously with disorder. People say entropy is a measure of disorder. Okay, and I, and I guess I should say, you know, no, it's not. It may or may not correspond with your intuitive understanding of disorder. If, it'd be nice if it was, because that's an easy thing to understand. We're going to take a look at the way entropy was originally defined. Yes, this is going to involve a little bit of mathematics, um, but I, I, the example I'm going to apply it to, the mathematics is going to get quite uh, simplified here. So basically, <clears throat> okay, the entropy change, if you have a system, a thermodynamic system, the change in entropy during a process Okay, goes like this integral here. Let's not worry too much about the integral, but okay, the dq, that, that's a quantity of heat that gets transferred to or from your system. Okay, if it's a small quantity, we express it as a differential, but it's basically it's a quantity of heat that gets transferred to or from your system. Okay, T, that is nothing more than the, the thermodynamic or Kelvin temperature. So if you look at it, you can see that entropy is really a measure of heat per temperature. Okay, and that's why we get units typically of joules per Kelvin. Um, okay, and we're, we're going to come back to this. Uh, it turns out that, okay, sometime in the mid 1800s, okay, this after this this macroscopic or classical definition of entropy had already been could come into being, that um, scientists began to realize a problem with it, and that was that if you look at this interpretation of entropy, and you look at the second law, it turns out that there's a certain asymmetry in time. And this is what we're talking about. Processes tend to happen in one direction only, one way only. Okay, but the, the paradox was that if you actually look at the laws of classical physics that tell you how particles move, okay, those laws are completely symmetric in time. They do not tell you that particles prefer moving one way over another. So this was a bit of a problem. And, uh, Okay this, okay, this guy Boltzmann figured out a, 
a way around this. He, he studied um, some very simple systems, some ideal gases, and discovered that really there was no conflict. Okay, and he ends up sort of coming up with a new understanding of entropy, a new definition of entropy. Okay, and what he did, well, okay, he made some observations. Maxwell gets a little credit here too. He observed some very simple things, that if you have a gas and you introduce heat into it, that that heat has a tendency to diffuse, to spread out in time. Okay, and that, was, that goes hand in hand with the classical definition that we just talked about. But he also discovered that this applied to particles as well, that if you have a container and you introduce particles of, into the container, two different types of gases, that they too had a tendency to spread out in time, just like, just like heat did. Okay, and one other experimental observation he made is that if you, if you take a group of molecules that start out very similar, like they have similar energies, similar velocities, you put them in a container and you let them interact with each other, that given enough time, okay, they end up being very different. They may start out with similar speeds, but given enough time, okay, they end up with very different speeds. Okay, and we might think of that as a disorderly arrangement. <clears throat> so when Boltzmann took all this into account, he sort of comes up with a new definition of entropy. He says that the idea that heat spreads out is completely analogous to the idea that particles also tend to spread out in time, that they diffuse. Okay, that, um, so he expands this definition of entropy to also include particle motion in addition to heat transfer. Okay, and what he does is sort of cheating here, but in order to make this new definition of entropy match the old one, he's got to in introduce this, this proportionality constant. Okay, and his new definition of entropy here that he came up with, it is also very mathematical, okay? So, um, but we're gonna look at some examples here. He basically says that S, the entropy of a given maker state, and don't worry too much about the word maker state yet, okay? I think example will show you what I mean by that, okay, um, is equal to some proportionality constant. That's Boltzmann's constant, okay, he's got to put that in. Um, this thing sigma here is simply a, a measure of uh, the number of microstates that correspond to an observed maker state. If this makes no sense to you, okay, I wouldn't blame you, but we're going to take a look at an example here, and let me go through this and take a look at what do we mean by maker states and microstates. And I, I chose this example because I think it's something we can easily see. Okay, so if you consider a very simple process of flipping four coins, okay, and you look at the observable outcomes, okay, what, what can happen with this? Okay, well, there's basically 16 different things that can happen. Okay, <clears throat> and we'll look at what we mean by maker states and microstates here. Okay, one of the things, one of the maker states you could get would be that you get all heads. Okay, that um, in order to do that, okay, there's only one arrangement that's going to do that. It means every time you flip a coin, you've got to get a head. Okay, so there's really one possible maker state that would give you that maker state. Um, so we've got one micro state, and of the 16 total, your probability of getting that maker state is only one in 16. Let's take a look at a few other maker states. Okay, here, what, is, what about getting three heads and a tail? Well, there, there's actually four arrangements, four different possibilities that would give you that maker state. Okay, and here they are. I mean, your first throw could be a tail and the rest heads, your second one could be a tail and the other's heads, and so on. So there's four possible arrangements, four possible microstates for a probability of one quarter, four sixteenths of getting three heads and a tail. If we look at two heads and two tails, maybe some would consider that a disorderly maker state, okay, well, now there's six possible arrangements that would get you that, okay, so six microstates for a probability of six and 16. If we look at, uh, okay, one head, three tails, same as three heads, one tails, or there's four, okay, for probability of 25%, and finally, the probability of getting all tails, same as getting four heads, okay, only one microstate corresponds to that for a probability of one and 16. Okay, so if we go back and revisit the definition of entropy, what does this have to do with entropy? Well, remember, entropy goes like the number of microstates. The entropy of a maker state is directly proportional to the number of microstates. 
Okay, the more microstates, the greater the entropy. Think, you can think of microstates as arrangements. How many different arrangements are there to be able to get that, that observable maker state? So looking at the coin example, okay, the maker state with the greatest entropy okay, was the two heads and two tails, right? Because that had the greatest number of microstates relating to it. The one with the smallest entropy okay, was the either all heads or all tails. Only one arrangement out of 16, your chance was you know, only one in 16 of getting that particular maker state. Okay, so okay, which maker state had the greatest probability of occurrence? Okay, well, it's no coincidence that the most probable maker state was the two heads and two tails. The least probable one was getting either all heads or all tails. Okay, so what Boltzmann realizes is that okay, when we talk about particles rather than coins, that the same idea holds that you know, what's behind the increase in entropy of the universe? Okay, well, for systems near equilibrium, it's a simple matter of probability. Okay, that maker states with great, the greatest entropies had the greatest probability of occurrence. They were just a lot more likely. Okay, and that the entropy will increase in processes, okay, because maker states with high entropies are more probable and they're statistically favored. Okay, so this is what's behind the second law for Boltzmann type systems. Okay, the idea that if you want to call them disorderly, okay, but maker states with high entropies are just a lot more likely to happen. Okay, so these two definitions of entropy, okay, we've seen what it is a little bit. Okay, we're going to take a look at what it isn't. Okay, it, as you can see by, well, the, the mathematical expressions up there, entropy and the second law, they are well-defined scientific statements. They're not general philosophical ideas. So when you hear people say things like the degradation of morals in society is a result of the second law of thermodynamics, Okay, that might be poetic, okay, it might be nice, but it really isn't a, a scientifically valid claim. Okay, I'm, I'm sort of a fan of the, I, well, Matt Groening writes the Life and Health series, and he, um, one of the, the, the things in there, he says that the second law of thermodynamics is something which all bad poets must at one time write about. So. Okay. Um, the common misconception, entropy and disorder, you hear the words used synonymously, okay? but we'll say, well, our psychological notion of disorder, our, our intuitive understanding of disorder, it may or may not correspond with the physical definition of entropy. If I use the word disorder, I'll, I'll try to use the word entropic disorder. Um, so let's take a look at some of the misconceptions now. First of all, there's this idea that a highly organized, complex system represents a system with a low entropy. Okay, we see that in the, these claims that we looked at earlier. This is the implication, but it simply is not true. Okay, um, and okay, hopefully, it, well, okay, the idea is that no, entropy is not the opposite of organized complexity. Let's take a look at a, an example here. I said, well, what, which of these systems has the lowest entropy? 150 pound human being or a 150 pound crystalline solid at the same temperature? Well, you might say the crystalline solid represents a sort of simple, not very complex arrangement of matter. Okay, yet, okay, if you were to actually measure the entropy, if you look at entropic disorder, okay, the human being is far more disorderly than the crystalline solid. Okay, the crystalline solid is going to have a lower entropy. Okay, even though its, it's design is far less complex. Okay, and when we think about, you know, Entropy as a measure of microstates is how many different ways there are of arranging a system. You can see that for a crystalline solid, the particles, okay, there's not that many ways of arranging the particles. The particles are held relatively fixed in a crystal lattice. Okay, there's not many degrees of freedom or not many ways that uh, they can be arranged okay, compared to a, a human being which okay, has a lot more liquid and different types of particles. If you want to look at, you know, how do you really increase entropy? Well, here's some ways that entropy can be increased. 
Um, if you take a system, if you add particles to it, well, you're increasing the number of possible arrangements, the number of microstates. Um, it, increasing the volume of your system. Okay? If you have the same number of particles, but you change the volume. Well, now you're saying that there's more places the particles can be. There's more arrangements. There's more microstates. OK, here's, here's sort of an important one for what we're going to talk about. Decomposing molecules. Okay, if you take a, like a food molecule that's complex, like a, a starch long-chain polymer, and you break it up into a lot of simpler molecules, 